Welcome. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar hosted by the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations. My name is Victor Trinidad with NCPMI. This webinar is part of the Digging Into Data webinar series. Today's topic is making the most of your pyramid model data with Megan Bondrams and Myrna Begia. Good afternoon, everyone. We are really excited you're here today. Um, as you heard, we are here to talk and have a conversation about how we can utilize the pyramid model um, data that we have, how to maximize um, the data so that you can make the most of the data that you're collecting. Um, I'm Megan Bondrams from the University of South Florida, um, a staff member at the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations. I'm here with my colleague, Myrna. Myrna, if you want to give a quick hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Myrna. I'm also with NCPMI at the University of South Florida. All right. Well, we are... Um, we want to outline a few objectives we have for our conversation today. We're saying conversation, even though we can't see you, please utilize um, the question and answer. We do have um, some engagement with a poll that we're going to try if technology works for us. Um, but our objectives, we really want to talk about the why. The why data is so important when we're looking at our pyramid model implementation. We want to walk through the pyramid model tools, and we want to make sure that if we're collecting data from those tools, that we're using it um, for good purposes, that we are making meaning out of the data. And a lot of the structures and systems for using data is about getting organized. So we're going to walk through some of those processes that can help us get organized around pyramid model data. But before we begin, we want to have a little fun and we want to really highlight the positives of data. And so sometimes when we think of data, the word love may not come to your mind first. If data can be a process that we might feel intimidated by, or we hear the data and we think one more thing, but we were going to share, I'm going to share why I love data, Myrna's going to share why you love data, and then we have a poll that you are going to engage in so we can see why you might love data um, as you're working within the pyramid model. So I love data for all the answers that I get. Um, I am a trained a school psychologist by training, and as a psychologist, um, part of my role was assessments and observations and data pieces and organizing it together. And when um, I could present information to staff, to families, that was meaningful, that was helpful. And I got to that point because of data, I was always really encouraged and felt very much part of a teaming process because of the use of data. So I love data for all the different um, questions that I can get answers to. So Myrna, um, who I know loves data, so Myrna and I both get excited about data. So Myrna, why don't you share why you love data so much? I do love data. So I really love data because it really helps you make better decisions. When you have data, you're better to make a really well-informed decision using all of those data pieces that you have. And sometimes that's multiple things and sometimes it's just one. And it really just, it helps you improve whatever it is that you're doing. And I, I that's why I really love data. All right, so we, for those of you that are on the call or on our webinar today, we are gonna do what's called a Mentimeter poll. And so Myrna is gonna put a link in the chat box for you. If that is how you want to engage in the poll, you can click on the link. You can also, if you're familiar and have the ability to use the QR code and you have a second device with you, you can use your camera app. If you've gone out to restaurants or out and done a, a menu list um, restaurant, this is how we often are getting our menus um, right now. 
when we go out, you can take a picture of, and the QR code will open a browser on your second device. And so we are going to give you a moment to either use the um, code or the link in the chat box or access it through your device. And we want to hear from you why you might love data. All right, so what we are seeing, and I'm gonna give people time to respond, um, but as our responses are coming in, our word, our word bubble expands and adjusts. And yes, and you can also type it into the chat. So we have a couple of responses. Oh, there. perfect. Yes, any way you can, we can have some interaction on, on our conversation today is really helpful. And so what I'm seeing, it's gonna keep, um, so word bubbles work that the more frequently a response is, that word becomes bigger. So the word I see right away, Myrna, is information. And you and I both commented that we get a lot of information that comes to us and we can use data to make sense of that information. Um, but this is a great, there's so many interesting words that I want to pull out. That word informed really goes along with information that we're using it to inform our decisions. Growth, we're going to talk about that um, in today's topic about how we can use data to focus on our growth. There's a lot of that inform, information. Oh, I really like that gives me confidence. We talk about um, feeling comfortable and confident with data. Um, and so one of the things we can do um, as part of our webinar is we can save this as a PDF and we can put it as a resource on our webinar um, page as kind of a reference. And I like that um, someone loves it because it's nerdy and that's okay that we want to embrace that, that it helps us um, do all the things that um, we might love data for. So we appreciate you engaging in this process. I'm going to kind of think about those words and how it relates back to the content that we're going to talk about um, as we move forward with talking about data. I think we had some success getting back to our PowerPoint. I'm going to have Myrna give me a thumbs up if you're back to where we started. So we're going to use that as a kind of a starting point for why we love data. Um, and we want to give, we're going to share a couple resources at the end, some references, but we do want to acknowledge that the information that we talk about today around the data systems and the importance of data um, that we use in our work at the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations um, a lot of our ideas are brought to us from the Center for IDA Early Childhood Data Systems, or DAISY, and the Office of Special Education Programs, OSEP, that um, some of the information and we will share where those references and resources come from. Um, but it's really helpful um, to think that there's this collaboration among centers that are looking at data that are here to support us um, on the use of data. And what excites me when I think of the, all of the words that you put in that word bubble about why you love data is that recognition that data are more than just something that's required of us where we're just reporting on something because we have to, and that data are more than a gotcha or a punishment. Um, that data are not, are not a hammer. We are not here, um, especially in the pyramid model, to use our data tools to catch you on something that you're not doing. Um, but we recognize that sometimes we do get data that we don't like or that we wish were different. Um, but without having it and knowing what needs to be improved, we can't get where we need to be. And we want to, to think about that mentality. So rather than we acknowledge that data are not a hammer, um, but, and that we are thinking about our pyramid model data tools, 
And they really are here to assess our implementation fidelity and our intervention fidelity. And what that really means is, are we able to answer, are we doing what we said we would do and are we doing it right? Um, at the program level, and we're gonna go into this, what are those program data tools? Um, data are identified to provide information about our full implementation of the pyramid model and to assess whether those implementation efforts are resulting in effective outcomes. The use of data allows teams to make effective decisions and improve implementation. Um, so we can think, and we like to think of data as a flashlight, as a light, where we can have teams that work together to use data that we can shine a light on what is working. Um, use of data can help programs explore, investigate, highlight, inquire, and think of all those words that we saw in that word bubble fit very much in line with this kind of analogy of a, a flashlight. I always think of our pyramid model data making us feel and making us feel curious. Um, so when I think about how does data make me feel, that's the emotion that comes to mind. Um, it makes me feel curious about what we can keep doing if something is effective, what can we change if, we're, if what we're doing isn't having the intended outcome we desired. So we're gonna continue this analogy of kind of how we can think about data as a flashlight when we are looking at data decision-making. So before we dive into data decision-making, we wanna um, review this important term and concept and just kind of go through some of these basic assumptions around um, what it means to have a data decision-making approach. Um, the first is really that we have, and we're gonna dig a little bit deeper and talk about this, but that we have leadership within a program where a clear vision around use of data is established. That, that vision is that data are not just a requirement, but they're part of our system. They're part of the way we work. They're part of what we do when we're supporting um, teachers and we're supporting children and we're supporting families. Um, so we really wanna have that clear vision around data and that we're able um, to use data to identify our outcomes. And we're gonna talk more about um, in future webinars um, we're going to have more information on pyramid model tools and what kind of outcomes we can gather from those specific pyramid model data tools. Um, we really want um, you as part of this Digging Into Data webinar series to explore um, the tools that we use in our pyramid model implementation so that you feel comfortable knowing what is measured by each tool and are they measuring fidelity and what outcomes are being measured. So once we have those, um, our data that's collected, we've identified our outcomes, we want to um, summarize that data and use that data to guide our implementation. That might be to alter or enhance our pyramid model implementation plan to implement a program change to support teachers with professional development, support groups of children, um, or to determine intervention supports. Knowing that our data collection and analysis is an ongoing process. So for those of you that have been implementing the pyramid model for a longer period of time, you might be shaking your head that data collection within the pyramid model, once you start it as part of your structure, um, it's an ongoing process and you're continuing to collect that pyramid model data. And one other assumption that we wanted um, to talk just briefly about today is this acknowledgement that we know or that we want to kind of acknowledge that data themselves are not neutral. Um, data are not always objective, even though that's something we say 
we say that we can make an objective decision. I find myself saying that often. It's an objective decision based because it's based on data, follow the data-based decision-making process. However, humans and data interact. We frame and interpret data. We bring our own lens. And so when I think of Myrna and myself, we often look at the same set of data sets when we support teams or we're working on professional development, training our own data. I'm coming it from, I have my lens as um, someone who's been a, a pyramid model coach. I'm a school psychologist by training. Myrna has her background. She comes from a public health background and has this huge extensive knowledge around data and evaluation. She's um, brilliant when it comes to analyzing data and looking at spreadsheets. We have a, a different lens. Um, it doesn't mean the data that we look at are meaningless. It just means that we're acknowledging that we bring our own beliefs to the table when we're discussing data and that we need intentional structures and a team process to analyze and use data that helps um, kind of keep us really, really on that path towards making good decisions um, around the use of data. And that when we have that team process, and we will continue to have this theme that data um, is best when you have a team, that there's leadership support behind it, um, that when we're thinking about our problem solving conversations, so you can, we're gonna do some imagining right now. Imagine the last time you might have brought up or discussed a problem at a team meeting, whether it was a, a pyramid model leadership team meeting, or maybe it was um, a meeting within your classroom or with your coaching um, that you are thinking about a problem and your goal is we're going to figure this out. We're going to get to a solution. And what often happens without that organizational structure that we talked about that's very intentional. We talk about problems. We might think we have a solution, but we talk about something else that's unrelated. Then we go back to it. And before we know it, even though we had the best intentions to come into a solution, to being good problem solvers, we run out of time because most of us, when we have our team meetings where we might be discussing pyramid model data, we might be meeting for an hour once a month. That's typically what our leadership teams are have, have to work with when they have their team meetings. Um, there isn't often enough time to have this full discussion we have a problem to get to a solution, we want in a more efficient way. And that's the use of data, that it can help us um, solve problems, come up with solutions in a more efficient, effective way. And it allows for a, a team. Um, when we are problem solving and using data, we have visual displays. We are looking at data. There's a visual context that everyone on the team can follow and everyone has the ability to contribute. And that decision-making process that happens as a team really follows this data decision-making cycle. This is something that if you've attended other pyramid model trainings, you might have, we share this and we talk about it, um, but we wanna make sure that we're on the same page as we're talking about how we engage in this um, decision-making cycle. So we gather our data in, with our pyramid model tools and we're gonna walk through what those tools are, but that's that first step. We're gathering data and we're looking at that data. Once we look at data, when I say data makes me curious, I'm, I start, to, when I look at data, I start thinking about things. I ask questions, I get curious, I wanna know more. That's that analyzing step where we're analyzing the data, we're asking really good questions. And from that process, look, think and act, we develop our plan of action. We put that plan in place. We see if it's working, which often leads us to this ongoing data collection and analysis process. Um, so when we go through our pyramid model tools and we go through our resources, this look, think, act process is how we 
kind of approach the data decision-making cycle um, with, within the pyramid model. All right, so I'm gonna have Myrna. She's gonna talk to us about um, our specific pyramid model um, data decision-making tools. So um, many of you might be familiar with this image, some of you might not. So what this image is showing you, these are the essential support structures that provide um, leadership, training, practice application, and documentation that's necessary for statewide implementation. So the state leadership team is at that top, is at the top of this of the image and it's that interagency group that plans and supervises um, statewide implementation across the different implementation sites and then after that you have the program implementation coaches that guide the uh, program leadership teams to high fidelity implementation of evidence-based practices and then the next is you got you have your implementation sites and demonstration sites that are guided by their program leadership teams and coaching, family engagement, behavior support planning, and data decision making. And then at the base there, you have that da the data and evaluation systems. And you know this is our focus today: is this the, the data and evaluation systems to measure, as Megan mentioned, fidelity of implementation and to really help inform program and state level decisions. Next. So um, we mentioned data and evaluation systems at that base, but really data is embedded throughout, right? The use of measures at every stage of implementation helps inform ongoing planning and decision-making. So pyramid model tools that are used to make decisions about implementation are the benchmarks of quality, the early interventionist pyramid practices fidelity instrument, for um, early intervention programs, the teapot and tippy toes for classroom-based programs, um, and the coaching log uh, we have for both um, types of programs. And other tools, we know that other tools are often used in early childhood programs that include environmental rating scales like the Eckers, assessments of classroom quality like class, different types of child monitoring tools, demographic data, behavior incident data, and the list can go on and on and on. Um, but our focus today is really on tools that are designed for the use of, of implementation of the pyramid model. Excellent. So some of you might be familiar with the pyramid model data roadmap and others of you might not be, and that's okay. And a little later on in the webinar, I'll show you where you can go to get it. Um, but this is a really great resource that really provides guidance on the collection and use of data to ensure implementation and intervention fidelity and how we might use those data to guide our decision making. So basically, it kind of goes and digs into the what, the when, the who, and the why. So it goes through all of the uh, pyramid model tools that have been developed. And um, if you go to the next slide, Megan, you'll see that the structure of how the guide is set up. So each tool has a description of what it is, of what is measured, um, and has sample charts and graphs. And examples, these examples tell you how you might interpret these data. So I, I find that that's a really, really helpful piece in the guide. Um, and it's a really good starting place if you're just starting to collect data, or if you've already been collecting data, just to, as a refresher. Um, a lot of people like to print it out and have it handy kind of as their, if you're that data person, it's like this, the thing that you have that you can refer to and you know what all these data pieces are. So all of the uh, data tools are set up in the same way. All right, thanks Myrna for giving us that, the overview of the tools um, that the team will use. Um, so these are when we think about the teaming processes that involve are involved with data decision making. We're going to talk about leadership, um, the team process, and the knowledge and skills. Um, so when we have our leadership in our program, we're not necessarily thinking about one person, but it's that collective um, leadership that we want. Um, staff and leaders who think about data, who 
frame the data, who ask for data, like that makes me excited when someone on the leadership team or in program administrator says, what is the, what are, let's look at the data. Let's go back to the data. That's good leadership around data use. Um, leadership models, how data are used, mentions data, um, and really understands the purpose. And so some of these are inner, are interconnected. So to be a strong leader around data, you need to have the knowledge and skills around the data tools. Um, it's really about being able um, to have a clear vision that outlines the purpose and the goals around data and the belief, going back to that analogy of the hammer, the flashlight, that data collection um, is not just, is part of our routine and it's not just something that we're doing because it's required. Um, the team process, um, when we support teams in implementing the pyramid model, um, we really want that data to go from data being collected to data use. Um, and so we can have the best data quality, we can ensure that data is collected correctly, that it's entered correctly. But if we don't have a team process to look at the data, then that data really is meaningless for the program because we're not making decisions around that data. Um, and we really want to think that, especially around that concept that data are not always, they're not neutral, that perspectives are limited um, decisions are limited when perspectives are limited, that we can bring more to our teaming process around the use of data when we have different input, when we all have that collective ability to look at the data and make decisions. And we want to have the team have the knowledge and skills. And so again, there's that connection that it takes all three of these to really have the team process the leaders and the team members um, in our programs, we wanna make sure that they're confident and comfortable. And so I was excited when that word confident came up in our word bubble about why we like data. I think it does give us a sense of confidence um, that we're making decisions um, that are based on data that we're using, data-based decisions. But to get there, we have to have a certain knowledge about um, the data tools and what they measure and what the intended outcomes are. Um, so in this data, continuing in our Digging Into Data webinar series, we are gonna go in depth into some of these specific pyramid model tools to help build knowledge and skills around, you know, what is the intended outcome of this tool? What is it measuring so that we have we have the right people on our team who have the knowledge and skills um, to make those decisions for programs, for practitioners and children and families. So this team process um, is critical. And so is this role of a data coordinator. And I wanna draw attention right away to the screen that a resource is coming soon around the role of a data coordinator. And as we have worked with um, state teams and implementation sites and community teams and individual programs, this is something that comes up frequently is um, guiding those teams on the role of a data coordinator and recognizing that in order for that teaming process that we just described to be really meaningful, um, that um, when teams are guided by a data coordinator and they have a strong data coordinator who is part of their team, um, that this whole process seems so much more successful because we have, the, we have a leader who understands data. They're modeling that team process and they have the knowledge and skills um, to share with the team. So we do want to spend a little bit of time talking about the role um, of a data coordinator. And the data coordinator um, is someone on the leadership team, a team member who will coordinate pyramid model data, 
they ensure that the data review is a standing meeting item. So yes, each month we're gonna talk about data. We're gonna look at our data summaries and our data reports. And we're going to engage in looking at the data, that data analysis, that look, and we're gonna think about the data so that we can have time as a team to make decisions around data. So the data coordinator is a role that could be filled by any member of the program leadership team, um, preferably someone who is interested in data. That's kind of like the number one thing. Are they, do they have that excitement around data? Um, are they proficient in using Excel? It doesn't say brilliant, proficient in using Excel. Someone who's comfortable navigating the um, Excel spreadsheets and would be able to do things like print a graph for the team to use the filters and some of our um, bigger spreadsheets that we have around behavior incident reports. And then this ability to look at data, to interpret data, to synthesize data, which really means to summarize the data efficiently um, so that when the team gets together, some of that process the data coordinator has done for the team. Remember, it's about efficient, we wanna be able to make effective and efficient decisions. It could be a behavior support specialist, a practitioner coach, or an administrator. Um, so if you are on the webinar today and you're thinking, oh, we, we haven't yet got to this point where we've identified a data coordinator, it really could can be any member of your team. Um, and we get the question often, does it have to be the same person who's entering the data? Do they need to be the same person? They can, or it might be someone, you have a data entry, someone who enters your data and we wanna make sure um, that we have someone, we could also have someone who is the data coordinator who serves this role. So there are lots of tasks that a data coordinator can do to support the program and the leadership team around use of data. I just wanna, we're just gonna highlight um, some of the important tasks. Um, one is around data quality. And so we wanna make sure that if we're collecting data, you know, do we have missing data? Um, do we, if there are missing data, what's the process for collecting it? Um, we want to the um, data coordinator to be able to summarize that data for our monthly leadership team meetings. And so that we're not coming with all the data at the meetings all at once, that we can focus on summaries of what's happening in the program um, summarizing data on an annual basis, if we're looking at, you know, what are our benchmarks of quality indicators. Um, and so being able to engage in that ongoing um, data process um, and make sure there is this whole kind of organization. And so the data corner needs to be someone who is an organized person. There is this whole idea around the data governance. And so making sure that our data is organized. Do we, are we using unique IDs? Are we being confidential with our data? Um, are we, do we have the ability to aggregate and sort data as needed? Those are those organizational roles of the data coordinator. And also the data coordinator, when we think about the knowledge and skills, we wanna make sure that the data coordinator has a good understanding of our data tools, what they're measuring, and making sure that the staff in the program are the right people who've been trained. So have our behavior support, you know, support specialists, have they been trained in the behavior incident report system? That's something that's gonna be really beneficial to this role. Has our, has the, um, classroom coach been trained in use of the um, teaching pyramid observation tool? Do they have the knowledge they need to complete their um, job, risk, you know, their responsibilities as part of the leadership team? So this data coordinator, um, we have some resources that are coming soon that outline the role, but also describe some of the tasks that a data coordinator might engage in that really help build that team process in a program. And as we've talked about, um, the whole point of having that process is so that we can make sense 
of data. And when um, we looked at that word bubble that you all developed, the word inform, informative, and information were the top three. That is why we, that is one of the main reasons for using data, that we gather information and that we're making sense of it. Because if we're just collecting it and we're not really using it, we are not, make, we are not making sense of that data. So we want to think about our data as that flashlight. We need to explore, um, shine light on things that can help us guide decisions. We want to inquire, um, be able to pinpoint what is working, um, what data um, we can have that helps us pinpoint issues and strengths, um, what actions might we take, um, and how might we monitor our progress. Thinking about our data tools in isolation might not be the strongest light. So we think about um, going back to the flashlight. When I make connections with my data, I think I get a brighter view of what might be happening in our program. And we want, um, as you go through and learn more about pyramid model data tools, we hope those connections happen, that we're connecting our data to our implementation plan and how it supports us in our coaching. How are we supporting practitioners in implementing practices? How are we supporting children in learning new social emotional skills? How are we responding to their challenging behavior that we're making connection, that we're not looking at just one tool in isolation, um, that we're making our connections um, so that we can help improve supports for children, for families, for our programs. Um, and we have to be able to do that. We have to know what each tool is measuring and assessing. So for example, um, one of the conversations um, we might hear is, you know, if the number of behavior incident reports, so that is a tool that we use in the pyramid model to track um, behavior incidents, if those are decreasing, that doesn't necessarily mean that our pyramid model implementation is working um, because behavior incident reports do not measure that. Um, they're just one data. Um, it's just one piece of data from one tool. We really have to be able to make connections and not rely on one tool to say, yes, yes, this is working when that's not necessarily what that tool is measuring. And so we have um, our program fidelity tools. Um, that well, That's what we see here. And Myrna kind of outlined that we have um, program tools and we have child tools. The tools can also be thought of, of measuring program fidelity and practitioner fidelity. Um, so without these tools, we do not have the information needed to make our program implementation changes. So we're excited that we will cover these tools in depth in future webinars, but I just want to briefly talk about them now so that you have a sense of what that tool does. Um, if you're newer um, to Pyramid Model or if you've been implementing for a long time, this is going to be like, yes, we know. Let's check. Do I know what this tool measures? So we have our benchmarks of quality in our pyramid model. We have um, benchmarks of quality that look at our early childhood programs. And then we have a benchmarks of quality that's specific to early intervention. Um, so our part C. So these are checklists that are used by teams, program leadership teams that assess implementation of the pyramid model across critical elements. Um, so we're looking at, are those critical elements in place? Are they not in place? Are they partially in place? And it's a measure of, you know, are we, do we have these things in place? Are we doing what we said we would do? We also have coaching logs, including the classroom coaching log and our early intervention practitioner coaching log. So there's um, programs, um, program fidelity tools for more classroom based. And then we also have those intervention um, tools. So these coaching logs are also program fidelity tools. They provide a summary of the number and duration of coaching cycles that were provided to teachers and early interventionists. 
Um, it's where we coaches record their action plan goals, where they develop, where they met, and a description or a record of what professional development coaching strategies did I use during those coaching contacts. Um, so those tools, when we use those tools, we get to shine a light on our programs. It can help um, that data from those tools helps us understand um, and these are the types of questions that we think um, get answered when we have data. And that, again, is why I love data, because we get to answer questions. Um, and you may have other questions that you use your pyramid model tools that they help you. But we can really look at progress so we can highlight strengths. What progress have we made in our program level implementation? What are our strengths, we think about our infrastructures of our systems. What do I need to have in place to support practices in our classroom? Do we need to um, look at our coaching resources? Are we allocating enough resources to our classroom teachers? Are there missing elements that need improvement? Um, so are we maybe not engaging with families the, the same way we used to, and we need to look at how can we restructure our implementation to put in more, to put in that missing element that will help us support pyramid model practices. Are we implementing coaching with fidelity? It's really hard to answer that question if we don't have data on what is happening during coaching. What practitioners receive coaching? Who did not? How we can have, if we have coaching log data, we can answer these type of questions. We can look at how much coaching did our practitioners receive? Who is making progress with action plan goals as a result of coaching? So we can answer some of these really big questions that help us understand our pyramid model implementation. We can do this for program fidelity, and we can also look at how challenging behavior, keeping track of behavior incident reports also might um, help us kind of answer some of those big questions. So we're not gonna go deep into describing the behavior incident report, but it is a way that we are gathering information in the classroom on elements related to behavior incidents. And we can use that data to make decisions about providing supports to teachers and children within the program. So it summarizes and collects data on factors related to behavior incidents. Like what was the challenging behavior and what routine or activity did it occur? Um, who did the challenging behavior occur with? What was our response to that challenging behavior? Um, so that it provides us that information, um, not only on frequency of those behavior incidents over time, but also um, the system has um, a analysis of potential equity um, by looking at calculates um, disproportionality related to race, ethnicity, IEP status, um, gender, and dual language learner. So a, a really powerful tool that can help teams understand. Um, and without this data, I'm not sure we could answer these questions. In which classrooms are we seeing challenging behavior? How are we responding? What are the most common types of challenging behavior children are engaging in? Are we using exclusionary discipline? And so the behavior incident report has a way where we can track, we're tracking the adult response to challenge behavior to see if we might, even if we say, we don't do that in our program, we don't exclude children, are we engaging in some of those practices? And then we can look at, you know, what are the, what is the gender, the ethnicity, the race, um, IEP status of children with challenging behavior. We can answer those questions by use of the behavior incident report. And then just as there are tools specific to program fidelity, there are data tools that are very specific to implementation of practitioner practices. So we have our observation scales that look at um, our key practices around pyramid model implementation for our preschool classrooms, as well as our infant toddler. So these observations focus on the adult behaviors, the environmental arrangements specific to supporting social emotional development of our um, pre-K and then our infant and toddler classrooms. 
And for early interventionist, we have the early intervention pyramid practices fidelity instrument or the EI PPFI um, that looks at um, assesses the implementation of pyramid model practices by early interventionists and the coaching of family caregivers. Um, these practices are aligned with DEC recommended practices and the principles of early intervention. So it's a great tool to look at those um, practitioner fidelity. And we data is used to really understand, again, we're talking, we're thinking about that flashlight. Can we notice, can we identify who those teachers are? Who are those practitioners? Who, what are their strengths? Um, what practices are missing or need to be strengthened? What can we improve upon? What changes in practice implementation have happened across time? How many practitioners at Fidelity are at Fidelity? Um, and if they're not at Fidelity, what does our growth look like? Um, so are we making growth in our practice implementation? And we can use those tools to help us better understand um, and use this information to update our implementation plans, to refocus our action plans, to allocate more resources, to make those good decisions for our programs. Marina, this is, I'm gonna pass this over to you. Okay, thanks Megan. So as we think about all of these data, it can really be over what, really overwhelming to figure out what to look at and how to look at these data because it's it can be a lot of data depending on your program size. Um, but there is a resource that Megan mentioned earlier that I think can really help you look at your data in a meaningful, systematic way. So these are the Look, Think, Act guides. And they're this resource that help teams to and practitioners analyze their data, look at their data, think about it, um, and create action plans. So each one of these um, helps you look at those Excel workbooks. So all of the data, all of the pyramid model tools have an accompanying Excel workbook where you enter your data and it provides um, tables and charts. It summarizes the data for you. Um, and so the look, think, act is just that way. Like, okay, I've got my data, I've got it in front of me. How do I look at this? Or where do I start? So if you, you know, for example, the program coaching, um, the program coaching log, the classroom coaching logs, you, the look, think, act suggests that you look to see how many complete coaching cycles are being delivered. So that's like one of the things that it has under that look column. It has you think about any differences in the data around, you know, across different teachers, you know, by teacher and across teachers, and whether there's more attempted cycles than completed. It has suggested actions for your team to consider and if you're unsure of what to look at, you know, these are this, this is a really systematic way to look at that data because you're taking that data, you're sharing it um, during your leadership team meetings. So it's, it's not, you know, you might not want to take a whole spreadsheet with you. So, you know, you want to be able to identify the things that you will take back to the team. Um, next. So now that you know data is being collected, we know why it's being collected now um, really as Megan mentioned earlier, we need to be organized to actually do it. So on the next slide is this, here we have a matrix and it shows you um, each pyramid model tool and the suggested collection interval and who collects these data. And this is in the roadmap on page eight. So your program might have different um, data collection intervals and that's okay. The important thing here is really to um, set a schedule. So when will you collect the benchmarks of quality? You might do it in the summer prior to the start of the program year and again in the spring towards the end of the year. You might decide you want a winter data point as well, but these are all decisions that are made at the program leadership team meeting. So you are making that decision about when we will collect these data. If you're collecting teapot and tippy toes or tippy toes data, whichever one, when will you collect these? So you might decide that at the beginning of the school year, you wanna collect a teapot, but you might wanna wait until children have been in their classrooms for a few weeks. So you might not wanna do it the first week of, of the start of the program year. You might wanna wait a little bit. So sitting down and looking at this matrix and thinking, okay, when will we collect these data? Who needs to collect these data? So that you know that you've got something 
you know, a set schedule for your program to follow so that you actually do have the data. Um, another important consideration that Megan uh, talked about earlier is data governance. So how will the program manage its data? Who will have access to the data within the program? Does everyone get to look at the data? Is it gonna be um, just the data, the leadership team who has access? So those are questions that you'll need to know. How will we make sure that, um, that we ensure data quality and security of the data that we collect? So pro again, program leadership teams, they should think about this and consider, you know, all of these policies, all of these responsibilities and procedures. And Daisy has a really great toolkit that you can look at online and download to help you think through all of these different issues. Because sometimes we think, well, I'm just going to collect data and you just kind of go for it. And it isn't until later that you start thinking about all these other little pieces. So having these solid policies, these procedures, a schedule, all of that really helps with data quality. Next slide. And other important considerations are um, system requirements. And this goes hand in hand with data security. Where will you save your data? Who will access your data? So where you save it depends who can access it. So it depends really on who needs to access it for one and that and what you have available to your program. So you know you might not be able to save it in, on OneDrive or save it on Dropbox. Maybe Google Drive is your only option because that's where you save everything else for your program. That's totally okay. And I have a note there and I always say it, whatever you do, don't convert it into a Google Sheet. Um, don't press that little green Excel button. I know it's very tempting, it's right there, but don't do it because the spreadsheets actually, they won't work. They won't work on Google Sheets. Um, so you can store it on Google Drive, you just can't convert it into a Google Sheet. The other thing um, you need to have the hardware and the software. So you need to have a computer, whether it's a desktop or whether it's a laptop, it needs to have Microsoft Office in it. If it's a Windows um, computer, it needs to have Office 2010. And if it's a Mac computer, it needs to have Office 2016. And this is because all of the spreadsheets have um, this functionality that only works on those years or newer. Next slide. The next thing is assigning IDs. So that's something your program might want to th think about. Is this really helps data quality. So the guidance that we say for assigning IDs should be made at the state level. If data is being collected, our data, um, if data are being collected as part of a state level effort, um, the state data coordinator should decide how programs will create unique IDs and train the program data coordinators and how to assign those IDs to staff and children at the program prior to data collection. Um, if, you, if the program is not part of a state level initiative, then that's fine. You just do that at the program level. IDs should be organized. They should be in a, in a spreadsheet, in a Word document, somewhere where you can have a really clear um, idea of whose data, belong, you know, whose data is whose and um, that you know what data that you're getting. And we'll have a resource that will come out um, in a few weeks that there'll be a, um, a voiceover, kind of a tutorial, and those templates that you can use in order to create IDs. Because what it's really gonna help you do is to have a better way to manage your data and make co connections across different measures. And so, you know, we, we talked about this before, but data decision, database decisions are really made as a team. So that data coordinator reviews the, your data, prepares data summaries before the meeting, prepare those data reports, ensure the data quality, they manage your data. And they're, a real, they're pretty integral to the team because they're the one who are, who, um, who are bringing the data to your leadership team meetings. Um, and so the team really has that task then of reviewing the data. And this is where the important work really occurs is during the monthly meeting with the entire pyramid model leadership team for that program. So. The data coordinator might bring in your data, but decisions are made as a team. Um, and now it's really my favorite part. And I saw this on the word cloud that somebody said something about the graphic outputs. So I like them too. Uh, so that's really fun when you have data and you can create these pretty charts and you know charts and graphs. And you know, I really like that part too. So in the Excels that we provide, data is displayed one way, but you can change the chart types to suit your needs. So if you don't, if you're not a fan of pie charts, you don't have to use pie charts. 
you can use something else. Um, it, on any of these charts, you can customize it to fit your needs. You can change the titles to show what you're trying to illustrate. Um, so it doesn't have to, you know, we're usually we're always training the data that it's your, what do you see, what's on the x-axis and the y-axis, and that's it, you know, you, that's kind of your title. But you can be creative with your title as long as it's it's actually saying what you are seeing on this chart. And you can do this with any of the Excels because none of them are locked as far as the um, the charts go. So you can change this. And so here, this pie chart is showing you it's percent of total incidents by problem behavior. Um, and Megan, if you click, if you don't like pie charts, there's also a bar chart that's provided for you that shows you that same exact information, but in a bar chart. So you can make those changes yourself if it's not provided in the spreadsheet already. Um, and that's totally okay. You just want to make sure that you're using what's most helpful for your team. Um, and that, you know, really makes sense. Because if you have a pie chart and you can only print in black and white, then probably a pie chart won't really help, you know, when you're in the, those team meetings. So you want to think about all those things. And another an important consideration when you're, when you're displaying any data that has percentages is to put in how many, what's the, the total? Because sometimes you say 25%, but 25% of what? So having that information handy on your chart you know, just different things to think about when you're presenting um, your data so that the team can interpret it correctly. And so not only are you sharing and discussing data during program leadership team meetings, but also with others. So we have an Excel that creates these displays that you see on the screen. Um, you can see that the message here are on focusing on the positives in our data because we don't always just want to see the negative or the weaknesses. We also want to celebrate the successes. And so here in this, um, in these two infographics, you have one that's looking at coaching, you have another one that's focused on teapot, you might share these in newsletters. So internal newsletters, you know, with uh, practitioners with families, you might put this up on a bulletin board. But these, you know, we want to make sure that you are sharing data as well. And again, this is a resource that is up on our website. So here, if you go to our, our website, challengingbehavior.org, and you go to the implementation tab and you go down to data decision making. So you kind of you click there and then you click there. Make it next. Can you click again? You'll get to the data decision making page. And at the very top, you have the data decision making guide. So that's that roadmap I talked about earlier, followed by all of the pyramid model tools. So you just click on any of those little down arrows in order to see all of the tools associated with that. So you have their classroom tools and your early intervention program tools as well. So you'll have the, uh, the forms in most cases, the Excel, the Look, Think, Acts, and anything else. And in the other resources, um, that's where you'll find the infographics. And you just answered, Myrna, one of the questions. Someone was asking where the Look, Think, Act resources could be found. And so I'm glad we went through. And um, so yeah, those little accordions open up and it pops up with all of the different components around that data tool. That's and everything is free to download. So you can download all those tools and all those spreadsheets. So um, we kind of leave you with this last quote. And this is a quote by uh, Paul Fleming, an educator in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And it's a really good summary of the purpose of data. So data collection and analysis is an ongoing process. And I think Megan said that earlier, and we'll repeat it to you a million times because it, it really is. So it's, it's not about adding more to your plate. It's really making sure you have the right things on your plate. Um, you know, so that's just something to think about. Um, as Megan mentioned, the next in the series, we'll be talking about the different data tools. So we'll dive deep into the data decision-making tools. We'll start off with the benchmarks of qualities. We'll look at the classroom coaching log. We'll look at the teapot and tippy toes at the EIPPFI and the community-wide benchmarks of quality. So each one of those will have its own webinar where the presenter will kind of go through the, the tool, why, how the developers thought that, that the tool would be used and then about using those data for making decisions. So if there are any questions, um, you can type them into the chat. We also have um, a reference slide where I did talk about the DAISY 
tools. Um, so if, if you're interested in that, those are here that you can go. There's a webinar that you can take a look at um, and a YouTube video that was also a conference presentation. So um, you might wanna check those out. All right, well, thank you so very much to our panelists for their wonderful insights. Your feedback is very important to the work that we do. Please remember to provide your feedback on this webinar with our post webinar survey by typing the web address shown on this slide into your internet browser. Your certificate of attendance will appear once you submit the survey. We invite you to visit our website, challengingbehavior.org, to sign up for our upcoming webinars, access recordings, download pyramid model resources, and more. Thank you for our funder for making this possible. This concludes our webinar. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.